When you need to connect a switch or a button to a digital system, like a microcontroller or a computer, it's probably a good idea to do something called debouncing, which is what we're going to talk about in today's episode. So, switches and buttons are mechanical devices which are far from perfect, and one of the things that they often experience is a phenomenon called contact bounce. So what contact bounce means is that if you have the contact inside a switch or a button, it means that instead of those contacts going together like this, making you know good contact in one go, they go kind of like this. They bounce back a little bit, which makes sense because when hard materials smash into each other at speed, they tend to bounce back a little bit, right? And so it also happens to the contacts inside the switch. But what this means for the output voltage from that switch, if you look at the graph, is that it doesn't look like this, which is what you want, right? Which is what it looks like in theory. But instead, it looks more like this, where you have this noise. Now, this bouncing is incredibly short. It typically lasts you know, less than a millisecond. So to a human, it's completely imperceptible. So if I press this light switch, there could be some bouncing, but there is no way I'm going to notice. So to us, it doesn't really matter. But once you connect this button to a, to a high-speed digital system, it does start to become important, right? Because these systems can be incredibly fast, and so they can notice this bouncing and therefore register uh, multiple input signals. So that can give you all kinds of problems, you know? So if I have a, a calculator, you know? If I press this nine, I'm expecting there to be one nine on the display as there is right now. What I don't want is that I press the nine and there are like four nines on the screen because the button bounced a little bit. And so, you know, it registered four button presses while I only pressed the button once. So that's the kind of issues that you can get because of bouncy buttons and switches. So now the question is, how do you get around this? And that's what debouncing is, where debouncing a button is mitigating this effect. Debouncing can be done in two different ways. You can do it using hardware, or you can also do it using software. So using hardware means you put a dedicated debouncing circuit between the button and the device that you're using, so the microcontroller or the computer or whatever. Um, software means that you connect the button directly to a digital device, and the software on that device handles the debouncing for you, which can save costs in components. So first of all, let's look at debouncing using hardware, right? So there are many different circuits you can use. If you go to Google, you type in, you know, debouncing circuit, you'll probably find hundreds of different ways you can do it. Uh, but we're going to discuss one that's really, really common. So this is a very popular debouncing circuit. So as you can see, it consists of a resistor um, and a capacitor. And that's it, really. That's all there is. And a switch, of course. So in this case, it's a little bit weird because when the switch is closed, the output is connected to ground through the switch, which means the output is low. When the switch is opened, the output is connected to the voltage source, which means the output is high. So it's a little bit strange because when the switch is off, the output is high, and when the switch is on, the output is low, which is a, a bit weird but it works just fine, right? It's a matter of turning things around in the software and you're good to go. But why does this circuit do debouncing? Well, as you might have noticed, there is a capacitor in there. And that capacitor takes a little bit of time to charge up. So when the switch opens, the voltage on the output doesn't immediately rise up to the supply voltage. Instead, it rises more slowly. Now, okay, I'm saying that it rises slowly that's not entirely true. It's still really fast. It still might only take a few milliseconds to charge that capacitor. But, you know, relatively speaking, the voltage rises slowly, right? So what this means is that if you close this switch, which is when the bouncing happens, right, the contacts might bounce back a little bit. Right? So first of all, they close, right, shorting the output to ground, so the output goes low. But then, as the contacts separate, right, you would normally, the voltage would shoot back up and you would get that noise going up and down. In this case, those contacts separate, but the voltage doesn't go right up 
because remember the capacitor first needs to charge which takes some time so the capacitor begins to charge the voltage rises up but it takes too much time for that voltage to rise and before it can rise to a significant amount the contacts are back together and that way the bouncing is eliminated well the bouncing itself isn't stopped but the signal that it causes is kind of flattened out by that slow capacitor that needs to charge again and again and again so the capacitor makes the circuit slow essentially that's what it does now this circuit does work but it's not optimal because as you can see if you look at that voltage graph we've eliminated that hardcore bouncing uh, but there is still a little bit of noise at the bottom because even though the capacitor prevents the voltage from shooting up it still rises a little bit which is undesirable so usually people also put a Schmidt trigger at the end of this circuit to get the signal to be really clean. If you want to know exactly how that works, go to Wikipedia, look up Schmidt trigger, and it, it'll tell you exactly how this works. That's a pretty loud motorbike, actually. <laughs> anyway, we shall just continue because I've been trying to do this take for way too long. So this is the hardware way of doing debouncing. Now let's move on to software. So software is nice because it means you don't need extra components and it's easier to build, right? So extra components saves cost, but it's also fast because it means I can plug the button straight into this device instead of having to build extra circuitry, which sucks. So how is it done? So we use a timer. We use a timer with a certain value that we configure in advance. Let's say for this, for this example, we use one millisecond. So what's going to happen is the first time the voltage goes up or down doesn't really matter we're going to start a timer so the microcontroller or the computer whatever device we're using starts a timer a one millisecond timer but then of course well before that timer is done well before that one millisecond ends the voltage goes right back down because the button is bouncing back and forth and it's going really fast and what that's going to do is the device is going to say, oh, so, you know, the voltage went back down well before the timer ended, so the signal was not long enough, so we're going to scrap it. Right? We're just not going to use it, we're going to ignore this. And then, you know, the voltage comes back up, so we're going to start the timer again. But then, you know, once again, way too soon, way before the timer ends, the voltage goes back down, so we scrap this as well. And then eventually, of course, the voltage goes up, but this time it stays up and the timer runs out entirely. And once the timer completes, you know, again, one millisecond, then we say, OK, so the signal's been up for the entire one millisecond. Now we consider it to be stable. And then we register this as a, you know, the button's now been definitely pressed. So we're just filtering out signals based on time duration. The signal has to last at least one millisecond before we register it. And the same thing goes when the voltage goes back down. It doesn't really matter. So then the final question is, what kind of time value do you use? Right? Do you use one millisecond, like in my example? Do you use five milliseconds? Or do you use you know, a tenth of a millisecond? How much? Well, less time is technically better. Because less time means you know, a faster response time, which is usually a good thing. But if you use too little time, then the system might not be good enough at debouncing. So it's all about finding that balance between effective debouncing and a fast response time. And how low you can go with that time value depends on what kind of button you use. If your button or your switch is particularly bouncy, <laughs> then you need to use a much longer time value to debounce it. Whereas if it's a, it's, if it's a really good switch, then it might only need very, very little, no debouncing. So what I would recommend if you need to build something like this is you just start with no debouncing because you'd be surprised how often you can get away with no debouncing whatsoever. And then if you if it goes well, great, you know, you don't need to do debouncing. Nice, saves you extra work. If you do experience some problems, then you start to use a small time value and then you keep increasing that until the problems are over. And that's when you found kind of a good balance probably so yeah that's debouncing i hope you've enjoyed this video and of course thank you for watching <laughs>